Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. We've got another great show for you. I'll share with you some horticulture tips to keep in mind this month of August. Also, as we gear up for the fall semester, we take a look at a collaboration between one of our landscape architecture classes and a local Stillwater Homeowners Association. Finally, Barbara Brown is cooking up a hearty soup in the kitchen. season we talked about June beetles as they started to emerge and fly around as adult beetles. Well now is the time to start inspecting your lawn to see if you have the juvenile larvae that might start to feed on your roots of your turf grass. So when we talk about white grubs again that's the juvenile form of uh, May or June beetles but it also can include other scarab beetles such as Japanese beetles and mask chafers. Now, depending on which one you have, they all have a little bit of a different type of life cycle. May June beetles can live from one to three years, whereas mass chafers and Japanese beetles have about a one year life cycle. Regardless of which one you have, again, the larva still has a very similar looking white grub that often is right below the surface at this time of year in August, feeding on those roots. So now's a really good time to get control of those. In order to find out whether you've reached a threshold that may need controlling, dig up about a foot of your turf grass or peel it back. And if you see anywhere from five to 10 white grubs, that means you might wanna consider treatment. Here are a few treatment options for white grubs. Also, as we head into August, it's not too late to still plant in the vegetable garden. So you can still continue to plant pole beans, lima beans, as well as some of your summer squash to get another harvest. Also, don't forget those cool season crops because as we head into those cooler months, those cool season crops often produce quicker and they don't need as much time in order to harvest them. So they're ideal to plant now. And in fact, they really favor going into the cooler climate as they continue to grow. So planting a few more plants will extend that harvest as we head into fall. It's hard to believe we're already thinking about shutting down the garden, but keep in mind as we head into August, you really wanna make your last fertilizer application on your warm season grasses by mid-August. That's because after August, a lot of your warm season grasses, including Bermuda grass, are gonna start translocating those carbohydrates that are in the upper growth down into their rhizomes below ground. This allows them to overwinter and be cold hardy during those winter months. If you continue to fertilize beyond that mid-August date, then you run the risk of additional diseases as well as the plant not being as cold tolerant. Here are some additional tips on your Bermuda grass and warm season lawn treatment as we head into August.
a local Stillwater neighborhood and behind me is the scene that we see in a lot of neighborhoods with a retention pond. Not only do retention ponds add a nice aesthetic value to the people in that neighborhood, but they also serve a functional purpose and that's to slow down water and capture it from surrounding areas. Now, as we all know, water eventually runs downhill. Today, we're looking at a project where the landscape architecture class collaborated with this homeowners association to come up with creative solutions to slow down water and prevent erosion. I'm the president of the Lakeview Village Homeowners Association and one of the wonderful things about our neighborhood is this beautiful pond. However, it's a flood retention pond and so we are responsible to the city of Stillwater about the storm runoff that comes through our spillway and goes directly into Boomer Lake and therefore we have to maintain it so that you know we can control what, uh, what is feeding into Boomer. Um, as you can see, the erosion from 30-some years of uh, storms rushing through there has kind of taken the earth under and around both sides of the concrete spillway that we have. So we have been trying to decide whether we need to replace the concrete with um, edges similar to what the city's done in several of their uh, storm runoff areas and or marry that with a rain garden uh, that could perhaps go from this bridge onto Boomer Lake. Um, but we literally are not experts in this field. So we contacted the Department of Horticulture and particularly the folks in landscape architecture about a rain garden plan uh, that could possibly add to our knowledge about whether or not that was feasible for our HOA. We, we're connected with uh, Professor Ching. My name is Ching Lana Luo. I am a landscape architecture faculty member at OSU landscape architecture program. I'm also an extension specialist at OSU. The class title is LA 3894 for credit hour class. It's a construction class, sustainable construction specifically for landscape architecture. And the class is usually for the second year landscape architecture students. And the overall goal for this class is for students to have a systematic body of knowledge about sustainable design. And she and her class uh, did a study of our challenges. Uh, we met with them in very early February for a site visit and laid out the challenges that we think we're facing. So we started our project meeting the clients and going to the site, doing an actual site visit, and we discussed with one of the leaders on the HOA, the Homeowners Association. We talked to them about what their needs were and what they really wanted to get from this project. And one of the challenges that the HOA gave us is that they said that the city requires them to produce cleaner water from their pond as it goes into Boomer Lake. And so our challenge was to create rain gardens along that channel that could easily uh, clean and hold a lot of water um, instead of just sending fertilizer straight into the lake. And so that was our goal was to create a waterway that would clean the water and, um, and also beautify the neighborhood. And then on February 18th, we got a chance to Zoom with them, uh, thanks to the uh, pandemic to hear their presentations, eight different presentations, and I cannot emphasize enough different presentations. We were really impressed by the variety and the creativity of the students. Um, and because they are a class in landscape architecture, they were also focused on how to make it a beautiful space that people could enjoy. The studies they did on the volume of water that their various plans could handle and uh, you know, ways to uh, slow down the flow as it comes through because the velocity is as much an issue as the volume. So the technical steps, once we got back to this, our studio in Ag Hall, um, was to do a site analysis, uh, essentially just documenting and rendering some kind of graphic to show what, where things are on the site, where water moves from, 
where there's more sunlight and where there's less, and also where there's physical obstacles and man-made um, obstacles such as a bridge or a drainage pipe that just can't be removed because it's too expensive. Uh, and then after that, we start looking for our inspiration and we start choosing programs so to develop a list of destinations and things we want to see in our site and in our design. Uh, so after we start developing a design, we start rendering it and we start with a rough master plan, just doing loose concepts, uh, and then it, it gets chiseled down to a much more um, efficient model. And then after that, we do some things called like section cuts or elevations to show uh, the physical changes to get really get down from very, you start very broad and you head straight down into very technical and how high you want things to be and what you want to physically be in each place. And then I think that the last part of this project was that we chose what plants were going where. And that was the most detailed part of the project that we've had so far. So um, we, we learned a lot about uh, capacity to deflect uh, velocity and volumes of water. We learned a lot about different approaches. At one point we had thought we, we kind of have an abundance of uh, liriope and mondo grass in some of our uh, common areas and we had hoped that maybe we could just transplant it and call it a red garden. Well, you know, the, the students kind of disabused us of that notice, uh, notion because um, having all one type of plant is probably not smart because you're gonna have wet years, cold years, dry years, whatever, and, and you need some variety to survive the varieties of Oklahoma weather. Um, and then as we've learned this spring, we're, as we're fighting weeds that have grown up in our liriope, do we really want to transplant that problem from our common beds to our spillway? Probably my favorite part of this project was the plant selection because there is such a wide variety and diversity of plant species that you could choose. And it's just a very fun part of the project to choose exactly what things are going to look like um, specifically and also how they're going to benefit the area. So what we feel like we need to do now is get some professional guidance. Uh, we need somebody that can help us write bid specs so that we can figure out, do we need, uh, you know, when you contact a, a structural engineer, they think concrete solves all problems. You know, when you contact the landscape architect, they think uh, plantings can solve a lot of problems. So we need somebody that can kind of walk us down the middle. Uh, not only for the cost of installation, but the cost of maintenance and the durability of maintenance on down the road. So stewardship is really our responsibility as, uh, as the HOA board. Um, in my work with various nonprofits over the last 30 years in Stillwater, I've worked with countless student groups in everything from, you know, marketing to campaign planning to uh, architectural things to this one on landscape architecture and I always feel like it's a really good experience because you get out-of-the-box ideas things that you might not have thought of and y you get the benefit of you know not only their research but also their exuberance so students eventually they will face the real world and their very very near future and that these type of projects prepare them to um, know a problem in the r real situated location with the real uh, client behind it so they can have a communication with the client and then they need to practice do a presentation in front of the client they need to practice the communication skills asking them questions and getting their insights getting their vision before they could propose their own design and this is what all of them are going to do once they graduate. They, they will face all of these challenges, real site, real people, real client, real community. So this is a sustainable design class, right? And so all the concepts and theory, theories are forward-looking issues that could be taught to students and that benefit students' future, but also by collaborating or helping the communities to solve some real-world problem that will benefit the, the community to help them get some brainstormed ideas of various ideas. Sometimes they don't know what to do and they don't know how many design outlets or proposals there could be. And then by uh, providing various concepts to the community and just kind of give them a lot of 
thought, well thought out ideas for them to proceed as well. You know, we got some really interesting ideas that are going to address our issues about, you know, velocity and controlling the flow of water and erosion and those kinds of things. So I think it was a very valuable experience. And in this process, we are very, very grateful to be collaborating with Casey Henges, um, Oklahoma Gardening Show. And with this opportunity, we're, we're able to disseminate all this to a broader audience. If you're interested in knowing more about landscape architecture major at OSU, please visit our website. Our Oklahoma Proven Tree for 2021 is the southern, Teddy Bear Southern Magnolia. I love the magnolias. They're, they're beautiful, large-leafed evergreens, so broadleaf evergreens. And a lot of people are familiar with the Southern Magnolia because it is uh, a native of the southeastern United States and is very recognizable among, amongst especially the older plantations of the south. Um, they're great trees for large properties and there are some huge trees down in the southeast. Well, they grow very well here in Oklahoma. And the neat thing about this particular one, teddy bear, is that it is a dwarf form. And so it's very suitable for the average urban landscape nowadays. The species just gets too big. But this one is a great plant. Um, it gets about 15 to 20 feet high and maybe 10 to 12 feet wide. So it's a great plant for the urban environment. And everybody's familiar with these large, creamy white, very fragrant flowers. They're just awesome. And they're actually um, pollinated by beetles. The fragrance attracts beetles to them and then they pollinate the flowers. And a, what will follow the, the flower is this large cone-like fruit. And it, uh, it's aggregated fruit and it has, um, eventually it'll develop these bright red berries, which are really cool on the tree too. Now the other nice thing about teddy bear, which the, the, the botanical name is uh, Magnolia grandiflora um, southern charm, um, also goes by the name or the trade name of, of teddy bear, but it gets that teddy bear name from this nice brown soft fuzz on the bottom of the leaf. So that's really cool. Um, the upper side of the leaf, it, right now it's bright green because this is all new growth. Um, eventually it turn a nice glossy dark green as well. So this plant grows just about anywhere. It's not really too picky about its soils. It does prefer acid, moist growing conditions, but once it gets established, it's actually pretty um, drought tolerant. It will, will tolerate um, short periods of drought as well. This is going to be sausage and tortellini soup. Now it's something that takes a little bit of time to get going, but it freezes well so that you can spend some time and it makes a lot. So it's a good one to uh, use when you're planning ahead a little bit. I've had one pound of Italian sausage that I took at the casings off and browned it. I use sweet, you could use what other kind you have. If you don't have Italian, you could use any kind of sausage really. Uh, you could even use ground beef if that's what you wanted to, to do. Uh, if you have enough fat left in the pan, uh, then uh, after that is brown, then just make sure you take that out of the pan and then add some additional uh, oil if you don't have fat left there. I used a chicken sausage, so the amount of uh, fat was, was less in this case. Uh, you may find it's more, you may find it's less. Just bring it down to about one tablespoon if you have some left over. To that, I've got about a cup of um, medium onion that I'm gonna add to that. And we're going to let those cook until the onion has softened up a little bit, four to five minutes. Uh, j just as always we do that, that's about how long that's going to take. Okay, we're going to start to assemble everything now. So uh, it, you've had about 10 minutes to, to do some chopping, or you could have done it ahead of time. One of the things you may have noticed, or maybe you can't see it quite well enough, is that this sausage isn't completely cooked. Uh, and that's because there's going to be more cooking done as we go along. I'm going to stir in... Uh, 
uh, two cloves of garlic, uh, now that we're ready to start putting things together. But if you come from a family where you know people are gonna come along and snitch bits out of the sausage, uh, then you need to make sure that before you transfer it to a, to a bowl and, and wait to add it back in, that you have cooked it thoroughly uh, so there's no chance of foodborne illness. Now the garlic needs to cook a short time. We don't want it to get too hot and become bitter. Uh, 30 seconds to a minute should do it on this. And then I'm gonna add the sausage back. And the sausage is going to come back in. You also will probably notice that uh, I left the brown bits on the bottom and we're gonna add some liquids to this that are gonna help pull those up too. So we'll add that flavor and keep that flavor there. This is two cups of diced tomatoes. Again, commercially canned, just make sure you don't drain it, whether it's commercially canned or uh, some that you canned yourself. You can also use fresh tomatoes uh, on this one. Turn that up a little bit more again. And then we're gonna add to it five cups of beef broth. Now, often you'll find that if you're using commercial product that you can buy it by the quart, you can buy it by the can, but it doesn't have up to be uh, five cups, and, and that's okay. You need to have about that much liquid, but you could add a little bit of water to it if you needed to, uh, rather than open another can that you know you're not gonna use in time for it not to spoil. I'm gonna also add to it half a teaspoon of dried basil and half a teaspoon of dried oregano. We'll stir those in, and then we'll start stirring in a wide assortment of vegetables because this, in addition to the sausage and tortellini, it's basically a vegetable soup. So I've got about a cup of sliced celery, a cup of sliced carrots, a cup of diced pepper. I'm using bell pepper here, and a cup of zucchini uh, that I've sliced down the middle and then cut into coins. And the reason that I do it that way is because it's easier to slice something that's got a flat side. So uh, that's whenever you're chopping vegetables, if you can make one side of it flat, uh, you have much less risk of, of cutting yourself. Okay, this is gonna come back to a, a boil, then I'm gonna reduce the heat, let it simmer for 35, 45 minutes until the vegetables are as tender as you would like them to be. When the vegetables are pretty tender, they don't have to be quite all the way yet because this is gonna cook for another 10 minutes or so. Uh, I've got uh, eight to nine ounces of tortellini. This can either be fresh or frozen. We're gonna add that in. This is a cheese-filled variety and let it continue to simmer until this is also not quite done because we're gonna add some spinach in it uh, when this is done. So seven minutes, five to seven, depending on what the directions on your package or your recipe say if you've made it yourself. So bring it back up, let it drop it down to a simmer, five to seven minutes. Once the tortellini are pretty well cooked, uh, you're ready to go ahead and add the spinach. Now, if you don't have tortellini, you can always do this with a thicker variety of pasta, say a, a large uh, macaroni or something like that. That would work too. I've got six ounces of baby spinach. You could use frozen spinach, same amount or so. Uh, it's just coarsely chopped and we're gonna put this in here. It's gonna cook for a couple of minutes. This again is a, a, a large recipe. It takes a little bit of time to get all the chopping and everything ready, but it does freeze fairly well so that uh, if you go ahead and, and make this, you can plan on uh, filling some things for your freezer and having meals later on as, as the, the winter progresses and, and something warm and toasty uh, sounds good. Uh, the other thing that you're gonna wanna do after this cooks for a couple of minutes is, is look at it and see if it's too thick for you. This is a time when you can add a little bit more beef broth or a little bit more water to it uh, and, and uh, thin it down just a little bit. Since it cooks without the lid on it, how much it cooks down is going to depend a little bit on how rapidly it's cooking. Uh, this one's cooked down a fair amount, so if I was going to use it as a soup, I would probably uh, add a little bit more beef broth just to, to bring it down and, and mellow it a little bit. Once the spinach has wilted to your satisfaction, you're ready to eat. So uh, go ahead and, and take it off the heat. And this is a great dinner. This one will serve about six people, six to eight, depending on whether it's gonna be the entire meal or whether it's just gonna be uh, something you have before everything else comes out. Sprinkle it with a little bit of uh, freshly grated Parmesan cheese and you've got a great dinner. This is sausage and tortellini soup.
For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. For the next couple of weeks, we will not air on the OETA main channel, but you can continue to find Best of Oklahoma Gardening shows on OETA World. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussion on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and Tulsa Garden Club. <laughs>